Hey guys, welcome to this week's Money and Investing show. This week we're looking at the topic of socially responsible investing. Being ethical, being green, leaving the planet in a better way. Plenty of takeaway points in here and there are a number in here that will surprise you, particularly the importance of this sector. It's not a minority thing, it is mainstream and should be a major part of your investment strategy for the year ahead. Hey there guys, welcome to this week's Money and Investing show with me, your host Andrew Baxter, and as always, my offside of Mitch Orange, looking very fresh. How are you doing, buddy? I'm feeling very fresh, thank you very much. And those green chinos have got on is really going to suit the topic of conversation today. And that is socially responsible investing, SRIs we call it in the industry. Mate, I live in Byron now, what do you expect? <laughs> You're a hippie Next now. time you see me, I'll be wearing clogs and probably have dreadlocks. Nice, good stuff. We'll look we'll we'll forward to seeing that day. <laughs> so yeah, socially responsible investing, which is, um, you know, it's not just a Byron thing. This is something that's been without question uh, an enormous uh, paradigm shift in markets over the last 12 or 18 months. And you know, as we're at the start of the new year, it's always good to look at what trends we see in markets continuing. Uh, and I certainly see SRI as it's known in the industry or socially responsible investing uh, as a bigger and bigger part of it. Certainly, I know we're gonna go through some statistics. It's probably going to shock a lot of people into actually the performance and, and some examples that we've got. But before we get into any of that AB, let's talk about what that actually is. What is socially responsible investing? Look, socially responsible investing is, I suppose you could call it cause-based investing, where the, the, the slant, the, the, the ethos of the investment manager or the person investing the money is towards environmentally friendly, sustainable, renewable uh, type stuff that leaves a far better carbon footprint and leaves the planet in better shape than what it would ordinarily be. So, you know, it's, it's a very defined sector by its very nature. And it really is the antithesis of a few other sectors, which I'm sure we'll get into in this Absolutely, broadcast. certainly. And it's a growing industry, as we know, or a growing massively, trend. Massively so. $1.25 trillion has actually gone into renewable energy investments since 2007. So it's certainly on the rise. Probably very different to when you first started on the trading floor back in the <laughs> 90s in London. Yeah. Let's talk a bit about how history and what's changed over that time. Yeah, it, it, it has. It, 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 it's it's a, an incredible paradigm shift now. Back in 1992, when I first started, yes, the Dusty Playbook, um, one of the firms I worked for, very traditional firm, um, was a pioneer at the time in green investing. And it's actually interesting when we sat down and sort of wireframed out what we're going to talk about today. And I'm sort of thinking back to it, and, and, and there was a particular unit trust, a fund called the Evergreen uh, Fund. And it was run by a good friend of mine, Susan Smith, she's a great fund manager, uh, and, uh, but it was embryonic. And, and the chat on the floor, terrible as this sounds, it's like, okay, how are you gonna market that fund? And everyone said, well, just find a bunch of tofu munching tree huggers. That's, that was the That's opinion terrible. at the time. Sure. Back then of people that were cause-based or environmental investors, yet sure. Susan and her team were really at the vanguard of that in terms of finding it. And, and that whole message, and look, the, the whole scope, I suppose, of being environmentally aware has certainly gone from uh, that era in a very derogatory way of describing people. And you know, if you look at the contribution of things like Netflix, for example, in terms of taking that green message and making it a mainstream, totally acceptable, absolutely normal view to have. You know, Cowspiracy being a terrific movie to watch to see, uh, which is totally mainstream. And people are very much embracing this, as sure. you can tell by the 1.25 trillion that's poured into it. Now, back then, my view would have been as a cold-hearted, blood-seeking uh, trader, that anything <laughs> that you do to constrain what your target looks like puts you at a disadvantage. And back then, it probably wasn't the easiest space to operate in because you know, you, you, you'd have investors that would say, for example, we'll talk about fossil fuels shortly in a moment, you know, no fossil fuel investing, um, no military expenditure, weapons manufacturers, sure. um, no meat production, um, banks, interest that, component. Look, for, for people that are investing on a religious disposition, which is a subset of this, absolutely. So, um, you know, a lot of our Muslim clients, for example, won't invest in, in interest bearing um, businesses purely and simply because it conflicts with their moral beliefs, which sure. is fine. And so, there's another subset in there in the banking, finance sector, pharmaceuticals, tobacco, alcohol, betting. You what know, about med medical marijuana? Is that sort of fit well, in there? It wasn't legal then. You've got to remember this right, back okay. in 92. So unless you're sort of ambling along Santa Monica <laughs> Boulevard, it was a very good chance that you weren't going to see this sort of thing. So, you know, very, very different world back then. And if we sort of, and, and, and it's always hard when you take the lens and frame back then, which was almost, as I said, you know, toffee munching tree hoggers, just the most derogatory way you could describe an investor that will go into that space. 
to what is now the mainstream view, and that's an enormous change in the lens. But things change over time, yeah, and, 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 and the social values change over time. And what we've seen is that sector truly come to the, the fore, not just in terms of the 1.25 trillion, which incidentally is about the same amount of money that the Federal Reserve has pumped into zombie companies uh, over the last 12 months, that which is no sense, when you look at that. But yeah, it, it's brought it to the fore and it is a very hot topic and not just in terms of money flow, but in terms of investor results, which is what we're all about. Great. Well, let's talk a little bit about some of those examples then mm. to put a positive spin on this. Yeah. We could talk about an ETF. Yeah. Uh, we could also talk about in individual stocks. So let's take Beyond Meat, for example. I think this year they're up around about 100%. Yeah. And for those who don't know what Beyond Meat does or what they're all about, AB, how could you shed some so light it, on that? It, it's a, it's a, a vegetable-based protein uh, meat substitute to all intents and purposes. And this is a company, you know, share price has come off the board a little bit. It, it was actually up uh, up around 250 bucks a share not that long ago. It's down about 140 now, um, but still up massively over that time frame. And these have, uh, they, I believe one of the burger chains, won't name them, have used them for their, their, their vegetable burger, their, yeah. their, their non-meat burger. Um, and, 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 you know, it's enjoyed phenomenal success. And again, you know, just mentioning cowspiracy, if you look at the waste of energy and the greenhouse emissions and the, uh, the toxic uh, material going into the ground with meat production, and it isn't, I mean, I've got a farm. Cows eat grass, they drink water, that's what they're supposed to do. Sure. They're not supposed to be, the only thing we add is the salt from the sea that comes off the beach, <laughs> right? Um, but when, I, when you look at the, the factory farming processes, particularly if you go through places like Clovis or Hereford, some of those places um, uh, going into sort of Amarillo, Texas, around that area there, you see these enormous food uh, 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 farm, uh, they're not really a farm, they're, they're feedlots effectively, next to a railway line where the grain gets dumped in and you know, 20, 30,000 head of cattle just feeding grain and then getting put on the train and taken off to the processing work. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a horrible thing sure. and it's a very low quality product, but it feeds a mass market of 400 million people who want cheap food. So you know, Beyond Meats have rivaled that and they've come in with a, a, you know, an environmentally friendly solution to it and it's been rewarded very, very strongly and it is the future. People are very minded of that sort of thing. Well, speaking of the future, let's chat about Elon Musk and particularly <laughs> Tesla. Yeah. Talk of the town this year. I mean, that massive tech rallies, we know they've just been added to the S&P 500 Absolutely. index. Now their share price is up at nearly 1,000% this year. Astonishing. Why is that? Look, uh, you know, this guy, is just a rainmaker, and I think you know a lot of people thought it was all dead and done about eighteen months ago. Myself included, you stuck with sales figures slowing down and so on. Uh, but his drive, passion, and vision uh, has taken that business beyond. You know, the share splits made it more affordable. Being added to the S and P hasn't hurt his Christmas bonus. I suppose he's now the second wealthiest person on the planet. But <laughs> I haven't met him yet. But I, I, I don't think he's motivated by money in the least. He's very much a cause-based person. He wants to get to Mars uh, and do his thing, and he's certainly making enough money to make that a reality. Certainly. So yeah, and Tesla with its carbon footprint, I think. Um, if you if you if you look and I know Stu Garrett and a few of our clients have picked up these cars. Um, if you look at the carbon footprint of what you save in energy versus the carbon that's used to manufacture it, it's carbon neutral within something like about four years, which is extraordinary in a, in an industry where you know, cars are the scourge of the world in terms sure. of the footprint they leave behind. So certainly Tesla has been you know meteoric in its success, but not just in terms of its car, but its whole ethos with its giga plants, where its batteries and harvesting solar and so on and so forth. So yeah. Certainly a great story, Tesla, and Elon Musk contribute to him. He's a smart guy and he works hard for yeah, my understanding. We've got charging stations at Nuribar. We do. Uh, road from us at, yeah. uh, at the, uh, uh, at the uh, Macadamia Council, just in case anyone's Beautiful. driving up and they need to charge. Oh, lovely. Well, I uh, get a bit of fun in the sun and to chat about sun. Doesn't work for my cars. No. <laughs> <chatting about sun. laughs> anyway. So taking a little bit more of a broad example, I mean, those individual stocks have performed extremely yeah. well in that instance. Now, there's ETFs also that invest in a basket of stocks that, you know, maybe renewable energy or mm. whatever it may be. So TAN, for example, yeah. it's a solar energy ETF. Mm. They're up 300% just for the year. Yeah, I mean, it's an extraordinary run again. And ETFs for people that are looking to just go, here's a, uh, an exchange traded fund. We've covered this in one of the previous podcasts. We yeah. have had a look. Um, if, if you're looking to put a block of cash into something and you're not specific as to the company you want to invest in, uh, again, TAN, T-A-N, it's solar. Um, buy your units in that and you've got a diversified portfolio of all things solar, whether it's batteries, whether it's the actual production of the, 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 the receiver, whether it's a, a sun, uh, sun farm harvesting uh, and so on. So it's all in, integrated within there. Sure. Uh, so a bit of a lower risk investment for people, but then when you look at the return it's made, it's been a cracker. Um, you know, if you wanted to go company specific, um, First Solar is one always springs to mind. Very good 
very long-term client, Lucas Chop. I hope you're listening to this, Lucas. So I think he's still up in Singapore uh, living. Um, I remember, you know, trading the first solar uh, probably 10 years ago. Uh, again, that shows that those people that were forward-looking were into this space back then, made a lot of money from it. So, you know, first summer's had a pretty reasonable run in terms of its share price too. And I think that fits in inherently well with our litmus test of relevancy and then the top-down approach, which we've covered in, in two yeah. other podcasts. Now, to scare a lot of people out there, I want to put in some interest, interesting statistics here. Mm. So if you take the social index, which is the renewable energy stocks and various other companies, versus the broader market index, since inception 1994... Which index are you talking about, the US or here? The US market. Okay, which has been a, been a stonker. I mean, it's an incredible performance. It has, right? So since 1994, the social index has outperformed. Wow. And you take the last five years, it's also outperformed. Mm. So people are really going gung-ho into these companies and it shows because it, it's it's doing better than the actual market yeah. itself and, and, and that's a shift that's going to be very very hard to reverse which is a good thing yeah and if we talk about fossil fuels for a moment which is the antithesis the opposite okay uh, and you know if you take a look at say exxon mobil world's largest oil company and anyone in the fossil fuel and hydrocarbon space has had no friends you know fuel prices have dropped considerably and you know, Exxon is actually a zombie company at the moment, which we've covered, as I say, in previous podcasts. Um, these businesses have really, really struggled. If we look in the coal space, uh, and, and topical in Australia, obviously, is the trade tensions with China, our biggest export partner. And there are two types of coal. Uh, and there's thermal coal, which is used for energy production. And then there's metallurgical coal or coking coal, which is used in steel production. And they're very different. Metallurgical coal has a far higher carbon component. So when you burn it, it burns at a far higher temperature, which is required for the alchemy of making steel. There's a little lesson on uh, how steel production works. Thank you. Iron all that, fuel rods and ends in there, and that's effectively where you can sure. So using coking coal is one thing because it is, a, it is the ingredient that's required to manufacture steel, and you can justify burning that. But when you look at thermal coal, you know, just burning something for the sake of making electricity when there are so many other ways that you can do that, whether it be natural gas, whether it's nuclear, whether it's renewable, whether it's wind, whether it's tidal, uh, any of those different things, particularly in our country with the amount of sun that we have uh, and wind in different places, we, sure. should, be, we should be essentially 100% solar driven here. And if you look at countries like Spain, I spent a time driving around Spain a couple of years ago, about five or six weeks driving around everywhere you go, either solar or wind farms. And I think 35% of Spain's energy comes from that, but they don't get the sun that we do. So it's possible to replace that. There's no question about it. So you know, our coal companies, bear in mind it's our biggest export um, after iron ore, by value at least, um, is uh, have really been struggling this year. Coking coal price has been good, but with the trade talks, the price has been cut out of that. But thermal coal, the tax being turned off, and what that's meant has been very unattractive from an investing point of view in terms of the overall return. But also, there are two factors here. The return's not been there, but more and more investors are shunning away from that direct exposure to coal. So let's say you're a superannuation fund manager, and you've got to do your year-end report to your investors, and you say, look, we're holding X, Y, and Z, all in the coal space, you're gonna get a backlash because most investors now have some predisposition towards not wanting to burn coal to make electricity. I understand you're gonna use it for steel, that's different. But for electricity, it's a quantum waste and it leaves a dreadful, dreadful carbon footprint. And so you're seeing that whole mainstream, if it's a good buddy of mine, another guy I work with in London Shoes, let's call him that, that's his nickname. The Shoes. Uh, the Shoes, yeah, he's running a couple of billion in a portfolio that's a social responsible um, portfolio. And, and obviously that these, these are guys that previously would have invested in carbon fuel and fossil fuels are now totally leaving that alone. So there's a huge void in the market from that. And you can see that firsthand um, in December, early December, early mid-December, uh, Daryl Impel Bay infrastructure listed up there in Queensland, and it's the preeminent port for coal export out of the, uh, out of the basin up there. And it's a terrific facility. IPO, down 16% on the day it listed. Oh, that stings. And, and it was interesting because when you actually look at the, you know, IPOs, you typically think, oh, we should have a bit of a bump out of this. It was a bit of a stitch up on, on the part of retail investors. They couldn't get the deal away where there was enough institutional interest. So actually quite a significant number of the shares are actually held by mum and dad investors. That obviously their broker called them and said, hey, we've got a cracking deal. Broker's got to make his two or three percent on the IPO listing. People probably didn't realize that when they signed up for it. Yeah. And they put him into a dog. None of the big guys in town wanted to touch it. Retail investors all over it, and they've been smashed by 16%. Maybe Essex should have a look at that. Who knows? Um, but you know, the bottom line is that shows you the appetite in the marketplace 
for, for world-class infrastructure, but it, because it's related to coal, nobody's interested. Well, if these big institutions with the best research, the best analysts, the best trading tools aren't investing in these companies, it really does tell you something, right? Yeah, and, and that, that to me was probably one of the starkest reminders that the big end of town is exiting that space. And the void, <laughs> retail investors that suck them in and get them in. And obviously we use that litmus test with our clients. That's why we don't have positions in coal. It's not just an environmental position. It's a commercial one for the lenses that we look through. And sure. has a work. Now, if you flip the switch on that and have a look at the other side of the coin, uh, this week, um, was it Australian, um, yeah, it's Australian Super. It's the largest superannuation fund in Australia. It's a huge, huge fund. And they've just put $5.1 billion into purchasing outright, outright, a New Zealand company that is a renewable energy business. And that's um, saying something. Yeah, and then, I mean, they're awash with cash at the moment. They've got to put that money somewhere. They're a $100, $150 billion um, business. And so rather than buy shares in it, they're of a size where they've just gone, we'll just take the whole lot and we'll just buy that company and privatize it, put it in their portfolio of renewable energy. So if you wanted to see in one week just how much that shift has happened, not a lot of re uh, big, uh, big end of town institutional interest in Darren and Paul Bay, a lot of retail investors and the big guys are straight into that renewable space. And that to me is like the full stop at the end of the sentence sure. saying this is happening, it's happened already, it's a growing trend and it's likely to be one of the biggest thematic uh, trends that we're going to see in 2021. So it's a great place to kick our listeners off um, to keep them aware of what's going on in that space. It's real, it's happening and it's not a minority, it is mainstream. Sure. The big end of town are into it and you need to be too. Well, there you go. It's a bit of a changing in the guard, for changing of the guard, excuse me, from what I can understand. Well, when you compare how derogatory my description was of an environmental investor back in 92 yeah. to it's totally mainstream now and the place to It's be. the done thing. And I guess that poses the question, AB, how the hell do you trade this stuff? Get into some ETFs, get some uh, good positions running, but understand the reasoning why with this. And again, this is important. This is why our education program is so important because that litmus test of deciding what stocks to buy, there are millions of different opportunities for you to invest money around the world in different things, and there are tens of thousands of stocks. How do we plant the flag and say, this is the place we're gonna play? Tough. Technicals, fundamentals, quants. Technicals, charts are fantastic, and, and the sustained trends are there. Fundamentals, it's a growing sector. The 1.25 trillion shows you that the big end of town buying renewable energy companies outright confirms all of that, and the and the uh, uh, the scourge of the earth, the fossil fuel companies are getting left on the shelf, and it's a very very hard sell. As I say, if you went to an investor saying we're investing in a coal company, the technicals are terrible, the fundamentals are even worse. Sure. So putting those two things together are very important. Wrap around the quants, our special source for risk management, and you've got a, uh, a very robust plan for getting in there. But that whole top-down view, there is momentum in this play, it's unlikely to go away, it's a strong performing sector, you probably need to have some exposure to it. Well, there you go. For anyone who doesn't know what top-down view means, certainly go and watch our podcast because I think these would certainly link in quite well with one another. Yeah. And look, I mean, this is we're, we're into season two of this now. And, and so there are 52 from last season there in the catalogue. And we've covered such a diverse range of different subjects. So our goal with these always is to layer them up. So if we're talking about stuff today, uh, there's a reference one to go back to, which perhaps gives you the ground floor information on that. And this may be the second or third story on from there. Well, there you go. And talking of stories, what a great one it is. I mean, yeah, but socially responsible investing. And again, go back to 30 years ago at the start of my career, never going to happen. <laughs> you know, you'd be almost laughed at for it. But sure. As my father often says, he who laughs last, laughs longest. And what we've seen here is that massive shift from it being a minority thing to the mainstream where the best results in town have been heard. So if you want to be on that ship that's moving with the right momentum, socially responsible investing is something you simply, it's not a choice, it's a must have exposure to. What's your downside? You're living the planet in a better way than it is right now. Spoken like a true bar and bad visit. You certainly <laughs> have. You've changed since I last saw you. Anyway, AB, look, thanks very much for that. That's certainly great advice. A lot of great insight in there. And it really is a major thing moving forward in terms of your investing. So thanks very much for sharing. Always a pleasure, Mitch. Thanks very much. There you have it, guys. Make sure you like, comment, and subscribe. And of course, hit the notifications button so you can keep up to speed with what we're up to.